morning. Let's pray together. God, as we've come into this place this morning, that has been our purpose, to simply magnify you, to adore you, to bask in the glory that belongs to you and to recognize that because of what Jesus has done, we are your children. And we pray now, Lord, that as we have the privilege to look into your word together, that our hearts would be encouraged and that you would be honored. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you imagine with me what this would be like? You go to the car dealer and you look around all over the lot and you find the vehicle that you think, anyway, that you would like. It has all the equipment that you need. It's the right color. The interior is just exactly what you wanted. You test drive it. You like it. You know this is the car for you. It's a big deal, and you know that in all likelihood, you're going to spend several years driving this vehicle. The salesman sits you down to fill out the paperwork, and you tell him this is the car that you want, and then you say, how much will this cost? And he says, oh, I don't know. Just, just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Now, let me just ask you a question. How comfortable would that make you? Cars today cost about half of what our first house cost. And you wouldn't say, I'm really not all that worried about how much it's going to cost. It's no big deal after all. And yet today, today, all around the world and all around our country, people will be encouraged to receive Christ and they'll be encouraged to join the church. But most of them won't even be given a hint related to how costly an endeavor following Jesus really is. They'll walk the aisle, they'll shake the preacher's hand, and everybody will say, welcome, and that's it. That's not it. Did you hear me? That's not it. You think buying a car is important? You think that's a big investment? How much more important is your relationship with the God of the universe and the very entity that Jesus died to establish? How big of a deal is eternity after all? Now, I know what Jesus said. I've read the book. I know what Jesus said about his yoke being easy and his burden being light. Can we talk? Now, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me. But for me, following Jesus is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Now, you say, wait a minute. Don't look at me like you're spiritual. You're a son of Adam, too. I've, it's never been that easy for me. It's a struggle. Living as a Christian is a challenge, and I dare say if we strive to do it right, that it's tough. Among other things, obedience doesn't come naturally to me, and the truth is, whether you want to admit it or not, it doesn't come naturally to you either. In fact, the only way we can ever be obedient is because of something that is, in fact, supernatural. People have told me before, Ken, you make too big a deal out of following Jesus. You make too big of a deal out of being a part of the church. That's like telling Christy Brinkley she makes too big a deal out of trying to be pretty. Somebody just said, I didn't even know the preacher knew who she was. You can't overemphasize the role of the church in the life of a believer. We need to be up front and we need to tell people the truth Following Jesus is costly if you do it right. Authorities in Roseburg, Oregon have not speculated, at least not completely, why the 26-year-old gunman killed nine people and wounded seven others last week at Umpqua Community College. The grandson of a woman who escaped the injury but witnessed others die on the campus classroom relayed his grandmother's horror story in a message Thursday afternoon. This is what his grandmother said to him. The shooter was lining up people and asking if they were Christian. If they said yes, they were shot in the head. If they said no or didn't answer, they were shot in the legs. Now, I'm sure that the emphasis nationally and from our political leaders will be about the need for more gun control. That's the issue. It's about more gun control as opposed to to what is now becoming the open persecution of Christians, but we know the truth, I trust. The problem is not simply guns. The problem is it's a culture of death that we have created and fostered in this country for several decades, but that's a sermon for another day. 
I want to talk to you this morning about a costly endeavor from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. And let's stand together, please, as we read. Matthew 8 and verse 18, where Jesus says as follows, or where the Scripture records as follows. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Thank you so much. You may be seated. There are three things overall that I want us to glean in our time together this morning in the Word. First of all, I want you to recognize Jesus is not interested in having people follow Him. He's interested in having followers. He's not interested in having people follow Him, that is, sort of find out what it is He's up to or keep track of what He's doing, but rather He is interested in having, in fact, followers. So there's a crowd. There's a big crowd. Big deal. Anybody can get a crowd, right? That's what we recognize from verse 18. There's a crowd. Jesus saw the crowd around, it, around him. There are all kinds of events, all kinds of things that can be used to draw a crowd. There are all kinds of religious groups, even this day, that are not doctrinally faithful to Jesus and the Word of God. And I promise you, they'll draw a crowd. There's a difference, however, between a crowd and a group of disciples. There's a difference. What is a disciple? According to the New International Dictionary of the Bible, a disciple is a pupil of some teacher. Further, the word implies the acceptance in mind and life of the views and practices of the teacher. In other words, you cannot be a true disciple unless you're willing to adhere to the teachings of Jesus. Don't miss this. You cannot, with integrity, say you're a true disciple of Jesus unless you are willing to adhere to the teachings of Jesus. This truth scares me to death. I know countless people who will say they're Christians, but they don't follow Jesus. By definition, where does this leave them? By definition, it leaves them outside of the family. And that's scary. There's a difference between being a disciple and just being a religious person. There's a difference between being a disciple and simply being a church member. If every church member was a disciple, there wouldn't be room in this building today to hold everybody. Crowds don't equal disciples. There are a lot of things we could do to get a bigger crowd. We could turn this into six flags over Jesus. We could pack the place out. We could have a theme park with my picture plastered all over it. We could have the Ken and Lori study Bible, and she could make her hair look like cotton candy, and we could (laughs) pack the place out. I believe the truth. I believe the truth, however, has to be told, and here's the truth. If Jesus is not the main attraction at our church, our church is in trouble. (laughs) And so is every other church, by the way. If Jesus is not the thing that draws us, if Jesus is not the entity that draws us and ultimately sustains us, if it's not about Jesus here, then we are above all to be pitied. We're in real trouble. I want, listen to me, I want people to feel welcome. I want everybody here to feel loved. I want people to feel total acceptance. But let me tell you, I cannot change doctrine in order to suit the culture. I believe the truth of what I heard a preacher say years ago If I preach to hurting people, I will never lack for a congregation. I believe that. I also know that whatever it takes to get people to church is what it takes to keep people in church. People periodically will say to me, Ken, you need to go talk to so-and-so. They got their feelings hurt about this, that, or the other. A myriad of 10,000 other things that immature people have to deal with. You need to go fix it, preacher. Go take care of it because we can't live without them. Listen to me carefully. Whatever I have to do or you have to do to get people here is what you're going to have to do or I'm going to have to do to keep people here. And all I'm saying is the only thing that will make us stay together is Jesus, period. And if it's not about Jesus, then we're all either lost, spiritually immature, or at the very least in a bit of trouble. 
It's about Jesus. Amen? This church is about Jesus, and Jesus is the main attraction of this church. I also know that's why Jesus has to be center stage, and then, right after that, our relationship with him and our relationship with one another are vitally important. Fellowship among believers really does matter. So discipleship just isn't, it's not just giving Jesus your heart, and I understand the language there, and I believe in that language, but it's more than that. It's not just giving Jesus your heart, it's giving Jesus your everything. You wouldn't tell your spouse, listen to me, honey, I give you my heart, but I'm keeping the Jeep and the checkbook and the house and the dog. She may rejoice if you let her keep, or if you keep the dog. But people today say by their actions, they're not giving Jesus their everything. I speak with people all the time who say they're Christians. But then they say, I really don't feel the need to be involved with a church. Allow me to quote the piercing words of one Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, I know there are some who say, well, I have given myself to the Lord, but I do not intend to give myself to any church. Now, why not? Because I can be a Christian without it. And Spurgeon concludes, are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your Lord's commands as by being obedient. That's a good place for somebody to say something. Amen? So Jesus is not interested in having people follow him. He's interested in having followers, and there's a difference. So not only Jesus is not interested in having people follow him, he's interested in having followers, but secondly, Jesus is not interested in words only, he is interested in words accompanied by action. Verse 19 in our text and following, and the scribe, a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, and I thought this was odd since the time I was a little boy, Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. A scribe was a teacher in Jesus' day. He was, in fact, an expert in the law. He was an expert in the scriptures. It was a respectable occupation, and these men were respected by the culture, and they were held in high esteem for their intellect. This man, make no mistake about it, this man was, in fact, a smart guy and somebody to whom people would pay attention. He calls Jesus teacher, and the dialogue begins. And he says that he's willing to follow Jesus, the teacher, but it's interesting to note, stay with me here for a moment, it's interesting to note that the five times in Matthew's gospel that someone refers to Jesus as teacher, it is always someone who is not a disciple or will not become a disciple. Chapter 8, verse 19, chapter 12, verse 38, chapter 19, verse 16, chapter 22, verse 16, and as well as verse 36. So there's a clue, just a clue, that this man's faith may not be all that we think it is. Although the man says he will go with Jesus wherever he goes, Jesus sees beneath the man's facade and he recognizes the man's pride. As we read the words of the scribe, we might think his words are words of humility or we might see them as dripping with self-assurance and confusion about the nature of the kingdom of God. As one author noted, it might be that the conversation goes Something like this, teacher, teacher, as one Bible expert to another. I've noticed who's on your team thus far, fishermen, lepers, soldiers, and middle-class women. Perhaps you could use someone with his head on his shoulders and with some religious respectability. Say, teacher, someone like me. Notice verse 19, and then notice what the leper and the centurion have said to Jesus. We talked about it last week. This man talks about what he will do, and the leper and the centurion talked about what Jesus would do. I think, for what it's worth, there's a clue there. Jesus then essentially says, Son, you don't know who you're talking to, and you don't know what you're talking about. It's perhaps a somewhat subtle rebuke, as one author notes, as if it goes something like this. Listen, I'm the son of man, not merely some scribe like you. I'm not just a better Bible teacher. I'm the king 
that Daniel wrote about, the one who will be given absolute dominion over heaven and earth. I'm going to Calvary. Are you willing to go there with me? Are you willing to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me? Homelessness, son, is the least of your worries. You may not you may not have a roof over your head if you follow me. There is more, however, than just a house to leave behind. If you see it this way, apparently Jesus had no faith in this man's faith because he knew at the base of the scribe's declaration was self-love, not self-denial, and a desire for power, not a willingness to give up power. The idea that he wouldn't have a home, no esteem, maybe even life itself, and obviously the scribe apparently isn't quite ready to go there. Jesus, he doesn't do a whole lot to sell himself at this point, does he? I mean, that's not the response we would have. We would say, oh no, come join with us. This is the coolest organization in the world. And if you join with us, this is what you're going to get. This, 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 and this. And Jesus says, essentially, I got nothing but come on. The Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. At the deepest level, Jesus' disciples, we as the body of Christ must recognize that no location on earth affords us a true home. Listen to me, this is not home. This is not home. Our citizenship is in heaven and we have life here as simply sojourners and exiles in the world, this is not our final home. This is not, and I'm so grateful, even as good as it sometimes is, I'm grateful to God this is not as good as it gets. Aren't you? And we may need, we may need that reminder from time to time. Was the scribe really willing to follow Jesus? Our country is filled with people who have, at one time or another, said they were Christians. The, the good portion of people in America today still say they're Christians. Churches have membership roles filled with people who at one time said they believed. But don't be too sure. Words flow with greater ease than actions. True? When we act consistently in accordance with what we say, people will see the love of Jesus at work in our lives. While shopping in New York, a woman noticed a young boy shivering in the cold November weather. He was pressed against a store window looking at a pair of shoes, and she asked what he was doing out in the cold, and he replied, I was asking God to give me a pair of shoes. A quick glance down at his feet revealed tattered shoes that barely covered his protruding bare feet. Her arm immediately wrapped around him and she whisked him into the store. She pulled several pair of socks from the shelf and instructed the department store employee to bring the pair of shoes that her young friend was looking at. He was soon walking around the shoe department with not only shoes for which he had prayed, but for socks as well, the woman paid for everything. She then turned for the door and she said, you'll be a lot more comfortable now. At that, the little boy looked up into her eyes with an inquisitive expression and said, lady, are you God's wife? Actions speak louder than words. So Jesus is not interested in having people follow him. He's interested in having followers. Jesus, secondly, is not interested in words only. He's interested in words accompanied by action. Thirdly, and finally, Jesus is not interested in delayed discipleship. He's interested in a commitment to him right now. Right now. Let's look together at verse 21 and following. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. You know, I don't know about you, but that response doesn't fit with what I learned about Jesus in Sunday school. That sounds a little harsh, doesn't it, for Jesus to say, look, leave, leave the dead alone. The dead will take care of the dead. That sounds a little odd. This seems so insensitive, so off the mark, so cruel at some level. Should the man not be concerned about burying his father? The Bible, in fact, seems to go out of its way to stress the care and priority that should be given to the deceased. 
Sarah's burial in Genesis 23 and Jacob's burial in, in Genesis chapter 50 and even the burial of Jesus in John 19. All of these are handled, as we see, with delicate care. Much is made about taking care of the dead. Is Jesus saying that when your parents are sick and approaching death's door that you ought not to care for them? Is that what he's saying? Of course not. Even in the midst of increasing paganism in our day, we still take care to honor the dead with the way we care for people in dying and then immediately after the fact, as, as well we should. Jesus is not attacking burial rites or the necessary concern one should express for his parents. He's not ditching the fifth commandment by any stretch. The key to understanding Jesus' response is found in understanding what the man is actually asking. If the man's father had just died, he would not have been following Jesus, at least not on that day. In Israel, the dead were required to be buried on the same day they died. So that's not the issue. Some would say the man was asking permission to hang out at home during his dad's last days or years. I don't think so. This conversation is actually, I think, about money. The concept of to bury one's father was actually an idiom. To bury one's father is a standard idiom for fulfilling one's filial responsibilities to the remainder of the father's lifetime with no prospect of imminent death. In other words, this would be the request for indefinite postponement of discipleship, likely for years rather than days. In other words, here's what the man is saying. I'll follow you soon, however... I first have an obligation to help my dad with the family business because if I don't, when he dies, I'll be getting nothing. And then once dad is dead, then I've got the money in hand. I'm all yours. I can't do this without this financial security, Jesus. And you're cool with that, right? And Jesus says, not so much. In fact, let the dead bury the dead. That makes, that makes no sense. Right? I mean, what is Jesus saying? Jesus pictures the world as dead men walking. He doesn't think things will just work out in the end. It's not an issue of less violence, as we're told today. It's not an issue of more education that's going to change our world. Because as Jesus sees it, the world is dead people walking. What he's saying is that the spiritually dead will keep on taking care of business until they die. They'll make sure that all of the worldly stuff is taken care of, but we as followers of Jesus must put the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Matthew 6, 33. If we choose the world, we choose death. But if we choose Jesus, we choose life. So what does all of this even mean? It means, above all, that the call to discipleship is a radical call. It means that other things fade in the light of Jesus. Remember? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. Remember? And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Remember? In the light of His glory and grace. Remember? How much will it cost to follow Jesus? Listen to me carefully. Everything. Everything. I'm not going to lie to you. It's a costly endeavor. If you surrender to Jesus, you'll be lied about, talked about, betrayed, bullied, perhaps persecuted. Maybe one day you'll even die. But one day, one day, you'll be rewarded. And I promise you, it will be worth it having stayed the course. During the Olympic marathon race of 1968, the world saw a clear picture of true commitment. John Akwari was running for 
for his country, and although he didn't win the race, he won the hearts of all who saw him run. A quarry was injured by a fall early in the race, and most runners would have conceded defeat and simply dropped out. But on this cool night in Mexico City, John Aquari picked himself up and quickly bandaged his bleeding leg. The injury took its toll, and yet the man got up and he kept running, even though he was ultimately miles behind the pack. Finally, more than an hour after all of the other runners had finished the race, he limped into the stadium that was now almost completely empty. Slowly, he jogged his final lap and crossed the finish line in virtual solitude. Bud Greenspan, a respected commentator, watched the spectacle from a distance. He was so intrigued by the heroic finish that he walked over to the physically depleted young man and asked why he continued running the race after sustaining such an injury. John Akwari replied, My country did not send me 9,000 miles to start the race. They sent me to finish. Listen carefully. Jesus didn't die to get you started the right way. He died to help you finish the right way. 